Well, CCS, carbon capture and storage, very, very popular these days. And today, Jeremy Lockett is going to take a, a sort of a macroscopic look at the, uh, at the entire industry. There's over 230 projects, I think it is, worldwide. We capture them all in Trove. And uh, today, Jeremy's going to pick out a few highlights and show that not everything's worked in the past. You need to be aware before embarking on your project. I hope you enjoy. Welcome to this video on carbon capture and storage. At the COP26 summit in 2021, most countries agreed to a net zero target for 2050 for the CO2 emissions. To achieve this, many countries have CCUS in their pathways to reach net zero. The UK has an ambition to achieve 20 to 30 million tonnes a year of carbon capture by the year 2030. Similarly, other countries have published their own CO2 capture targets. This talk has been titled Carbon Capture, Utilisation and Storage, specifically include the capture of anthropogenic CO2 and its use for enhanced oil recovery. This makes up such a large part of the global carbon capture activity that it needs to be included in any sensible discussion. We will look at the overall CCUS position globally, and then some specific CCUS projects that might be representative of a typical project. Some of these have been developed as planned, but others have encountered some interesting technical issues. This map shows operational CCS sites worldwide. Each of these locations has some equipment or plant in place for either capturing or storing CO2. Even though the equipment may be in place, it is not necessarily the case that CO2 is being captured or stored on any given day, as the operation of some of these plants is quite variable. Not all plants capture and store CO2. Some just capture and others just store. The scale of sites varies between those doing relatively small capture and storage R&D type projects to those which are large scale commercial operations. This map includes sites where anthropogenic CO2 is captured for use in enhanced oil recovery. Anthropogenic CO2 captured for EOR is by far the largest capture activity worldwide. The most carbon capture is done by oil and gas industry, essentially capturing its own CO2 and using it for EOR. This is particularly dominant in North America, where you can see many of the sites. The total capture capacity for anthropogenic CO2 worldwide is about 48 million tonnes per year. This graph is an attempt to show how much anthropogenic CO2 has been captured and sequestrated since the first carbon capture project in 1972. We estimate the total captured CO2 volume to amount to around 600 million tonnes. Relatively little CO2 has been stored in Ceylon aquifers, shown as the blue bars, or depleted hydrocarbon fields, shown in the yellow. Industrial use of CO2 is also relatively small. Most of the stored CO2 is in EOR projects. In these, captured CO2 is being injected into oil reservoirs to increase production. Inevitably, some of the injected CO2 returns via the well stream. So the question arises, how much CO2 is retained in the reservoir and can be considered stores? For this graph, we've assumed that 60% of the injected CO2 is retained in the reservoir at the end of the EOR process. This is based on data from the Weber Middale field in Canada. In general terms, there's little hard data on the subject and significant uncertainty as to what the number should be. However, it does seem reasonable to claim that the CO2 retained in the reservoir during EOR represents a significant portion of the total stored CO2 to date. It's important to note that in the USA, natural CO2 fields are produced explicitly for the purposes of EOR. These large non-anthropogenic CO2 volumes are not included in this or any other graphs or numbers shown within this video. We would argue that producing natural CO2 gas fields for EOR use should not be included in any assessment of CCUS. This slide shows a breakdown of the source of the CO2 to be captured worldwide in 2020. The majority of captured CO2 comes from natural gas processing plants. These are processing natural gas streams and removing CO2 to bring the natural gas up to a sales specification. Significant amounts of CO2 are also captured from coal gasification plants, where coal is cooked to produce syngas, and also at coal-fired power stations, reflecting the continuing importance of coal within the global energy system. Oil refineries and ethanol plants are also a significant single source of CO2. The remainder of the captured CO2 comes from numerous industrial sites worldwide. Where does the captured CO2 go? 
This chart shows the fate of captured CO2 in the year 2020. The majority is injected into oil fields for EOR. Most of the remainder is injected into cell aquifers or depleted gas fields. Industrial use of CO2 is relatively minor. It is of note the amount of CO2 injected into oil fields for EOR will be larger than that which would be considered stored or sequestrated on a global basis. This bubble plot shows the annual capture capacity of projects by startup year. It is for projects that are currently operational, so that any that have been shut down over the years are not included. Cell and aquifer projects are shown in blue, EOR projects are shown in green. Anthropogenic CO2 at scale started in 1972 at the Terrell Valvade gas plants in Texas. Here, CO2 was captured from natural gas processing plants and used for EOR in local fields. The world's first Ceylon aquifer storage project was at the Sleipner field in Norway, commencing in 1996. Most of the projects on the graph capture around 2 million tonnes per annum or less, although there are some larger projects capturing CO2 for EOR purposes. The standout project is the Century Gas Processing Plant in Texas, which captures around 8 million tonnes a year for use in EOR. This plant is apparently the largest single industrial CO2 source in North America. The plot also shows several named projects, which we'll come on to discuss later on in this video. The first of the projects I'd like to discuss is the Great Plains Sinfield Plant, located in North Dakota, which is the only commercial scale coal gasification plant in the United States. The plant gasifies locally mined coal and captures about half the CO2 it generates. About 3 million tonnes per annum is captured and piped northwards across the border to Canada, where it is injected into the Weber Midday oil field for EOR. CO2 capture started in the year 2000, and we think this was the world's first industrial scale transnational CO2 shipment. Data from the Weber Middale field suggests about 28 million tonnes of CO2 has been permanently stored in the field, making this one of the world's largest documented CO2 storage projects to date. The total cost of the project covering the Sinfield plant, the CO2 capture plant, and the pipeline was about $2.3 billion which was partially funded by the United States government. This is the Petronova Carbon Capture Project. Located on the Texas Gulf Coast, it is, or more accurately was, the world's largest post-combustion carbon capture project. Beset with problems, the CO2 capture plant was actually mothballed in the year 2020, although the coal-fired power plant is still running. The project involved retrofitting a carbon capture plant to the WA Parish coal-fired power station, the captured CO2 was then piped to the nearby West Ranch oil field, where it was used for EOR. The CO2 capture plant was designed to capture 1.4 million tonnes per annum, which is about 90% of the CO2 produced by the power station. From startup in the year 2017, the capture plant had technical problems and less than 10% of the produced CO2 was captured. This, combined with poor performance of the EOR work at the West Ranch field, undermined the economics of the project resulting in the decision to shut down the carbon capture plant. The plant's $1 billion cost was partially funded by the US taxpayer, and its failure has caused the project to be cited by US politicians in debates about their domestic energy policy and taxpayer subsidy. Moving to two projects in Norway, the Sleipnir and Snow White fields. Both are Ceylon aquifer projects, well documented and familiar to those working in oil and gas in Europe. Sleipnir, is the world's first commercial scale Ceylon aquifer storage project, having started in 1996. Since that date, it's injected just under 1 million tonnes of CO2 per year, with no real operational issues. Extensive technical data has been gathered from the outset, and this is widely reported and openly accessible. Snow White started capturing CO2 in the year 2008, and both Snow White and Sleipner are relatively similar in terms of the capture capacity of a bit less than 1 million tonnes per annum. Both fields are natural gas fields which have enough CO2 in their well stream to require removal to meet the gas sales specification. At Sleipnir, the CO2 is removed on the offshore platform and injected into a cell and aquifer that actually lies above the gas producing horizon. At Snow White, CO2 is removed at an onshore gas processing plant and then re injected into a cell and aquifer lying below the gas producing horizon. In both fields, the aquifer use of the CO2 injection is isolated from any natural gas producing horizons. Unlike Great Plains Sinfield and the Petronova, there is no EOR component in this project. 
and the economic driver is a CO2 tax introduced by the Norwegian government. This is the CCUS project in Canada. It can be viewed as a flagship project for Shell the operator. CO2 is captured from the Scotford upgrader, which processes oil sand bitumen into a synthetic diesel fuel. The CO2 is transported by pipeline and injected into a saline aquifer. The saline aquifer is the Mount Simon sandstone formation, which is a basal Cambrian sand. CO2 injection started in 2015 through two injection wells with capacity of 1.2 million tonnes a year. Project cost was 1.4 billion Canadian dollars, a significant proportion of which came from the government. Much information is in the public domain, including OPEX and CAPEX costs for the project. Shell have also stated in recent conference presentations that with the experience of the Quest project, they could do future lookalikes significantly cheaper. The basal Cambrian sandstone saline aquifer extends over wide parts of Central North America and is being viewed as a potential store for several other CCS projects. The Insala gas project in Algeria was an industrial scale demonstration of geological storage. CO2 injection started in 2004, at which time it was the world's second saline aquifer storage project of scale. CO2 was removed from the natural gas well stream injected into the saline aquifer below the depleted gas reservoir. Unlike Sleipnir and Snow White, at Insala the saline aquifer was in contact with the water leg of the gas field and its condition may have been modified by the gas production activity. Injection capacity was 1.2 million tonnes a year, and a total of 3.8 million tonnes was captured before the project was shut down in the year 2011. The CO2 injection triggered a small earthquake. Whilst this had no impact on any structures, it was considered indicative of potential failure of the top seal of the Ceylon aquifer, and injection operations were shut down. This is the only example of CCUS-induced seismicity in silent aquifers that we're aware of. The Gorgon LNG project is located off northwest Australia. Gas from the Gorgon field is pipelined to Barrow Island, where it is processed and loaded into LNG carriers for export. Gorgon gas contains 14% CO2, which needs to be removed prior to the LNG export. As part of the field development plan, the captured CO2 was to be injected into the Ceylon aquifer below Barrow Island. The Ceylon aquifer is part of the depleted Barra Island oil field and its initial conditions have been significantly modified by oil production activity. Carbon capture started in 2018 with a planned capacity of 3.3 million tonnes per annum, but this has never been achieved, with only about 1 million tonnes per annum being reached. Sanding problems in the injection wells reduce the injectivity such that the planned capacity has never been reached. It is planned to recomplete all the injection wells with sand screens and also add lateral completions to meet the injectivity requirements. The carbon capture target was part of the field development plan approved by the Western Australian Government. To make up for the shortfall in the project, the project has been buying carbon credits to fulfil its obligations. The shortfall has led environmental groups to describe the project as the largest polluter in Western Australia, an accolade which the project was not seeking. What can we see as future developments? We recognise over 200 active CCUS projects worldwide, many starting up within the last 18 months. Significantly, a lot of these projects are seeking to store CO2 in saline aquifers. This is also true in the US, where EOR has been dominant to date. The United States 45Q tax relief scheme, whereby a tax relief of $50 a tonne for storing CO2 in saline aquifers, is a key driving force in this change in focus. All the projects discussed in the video are single source, single sink projects where CO2 from individual capture plant is injected into a single store. This is generally true for almost all worldwide projects under those involved in the US for EOR. There is an emerging storage as a service business model where a storage site operator is looking to take anyone's CO2 and store it for a price. A good example of this is the Northern Lights project in Norway, where CO2 store is potentially open to anyone who can get their CO2 to the onshore terminal. This opens the possibility of some smaller industrial sites being able to use a CO2 disposal service, much like a normal industrial waste disposal service. The scale of some of the future projects is huge. Exxon proposes Houston CCUS hub capable of capturing 100 million tonnes of CO2 by the year 2030. This is about twice the existing global capacity. 
Although the details of some of these large projects is sparse, inevitably not all will come to fruition, it does reflect the ambition of the industry. In the US, midstream oil and gas companies are also looking to transport and capture CO2. An entrepreneurial example of this is Summit Carbon Solutions, who are planning to capture CO2 from numerous bioethanol plants throughout the Midwestern states. The captured CO2 will then be transported by a new pipeline network to Salem Aquifer Store in Dakota. Although the technical details of the US project is often sparse, the 45 tax credit system does provide a firm commercial basis for the potential investors to conceive and plan CCUS projects. The UK and European Union are also developing their own policies for CCUS. Inevitably, the regulatory and commercial environments will differ in line with the national priorities. In the next few years, it'll be interesting to see how CCUS expands as an industry and what projects go forward and how various government policies are changed as the commercial landscape develops. Thanks for listening. Hopefully you found it interesting. If you want to see more videos and first subsurface, please subscribe to our channel. Thank you. Well, we believe that uh, Trove Carbon Capture is probably the most comprehensive analog database in existence. And it is huge. It's full of material. So uh, please uh, ask to see a demo of it. Um, understand what's been tried in different parts of the world, what works, what doesn't work. And hopefully uh, that's giving the information and help justify your project um, within your company. Uh, thanks for watching. I hope to see you back on our channel before too long. Bye for now.